What's going on guys, Vulcan here, and today we are covering everything that's been released about Wonderlands so far. Now, this game is massive, and because of that, it deserves a massive guide. Guys, this is probably one of the largest ones that I've ever put together. I really hope you like it. The Ultimate Starter Guide has everything you need to know to get started on day one. So, let's get into it. What I want to talk about first is what is Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. Well, this is a completely standalone game from the makers of Borderlands. Now, it will share characters from the game, but it's not part of that series. So don't expect to see any story continuation or anything like that in this game. But I would say, don't let that drive you away. The game still looks incredible. And early testers mentioned that the game takes everything that Borderlands 3 did and just builds on it. So we're gonna be talking about how to mix classes, taking a look at legendary loot, covering the new melee weapons, and so much more. Welcome to the Ultimate Starter Guide. So the next thing I wanna talk about is the world of Wonderlands. So this world is split into two sections, the actual levels, which we will refer to as the game world, and then you have the overworld, which is this tabletop RPG inspired map that you get to kind of move your character through. Now, the overworld is full of quests, dungeons, and secrets. Now, there might even be a resource gathering system in place. We see some of the cool, like, little mining nodes scattered across the map. It's not confirmed, but it would be pretty awesome to see something like that for crafting for Wonderlands. So, it's probably not in there, but anyway, I figured I would call it out just in case. And just like in previous Borderlands games, you have a central hub. This one is called Izzy's Fizzies, and this is going to be your one-stop shop for literally everything in the game. Here you can pick up quests to help you advance the game, or you can even pick up side quests to earn extra rewards to give you a little bit more power to continue on with the story. Now, as you move around the overworld map, you're gonna find entrances to new levels. And at this point, you're then zoned in and things will look a little bit more familiar to you. You'll see your weapon and you'll see your typical UI. Now, at the entrance to each world level, you'll have vending machines, just like in Borderlands. Now, these will let you stock up on health, ammo, or purchase upgrades. Now, we haven't seen exactly what these will look like quite yet, but I'm guessing it'll be similar to previous games. Now, one of the coolest things that Gearbox added to this game are the classic RPG enemies. I mean, these are staples. If you have an RPG, especially a tabletop RPG, you almost have to have these ones in there. So anyway, these do have a little bit of a Borderlands twist, but you want to look out for the Mimic, which looks like a chest and will attack you once you try to open it. Now, once it's defeated, it explodes with gold that you can then spend on valuable items. And then we have the Loot Goblin, this kind of jester looking thing that explodes with extra gear when it's killed. And then a really cool hidden item is added to the game called Lucky Dice. Now this will automatically roll a number and the higher it goes, the better loot that you get. However, this does have a permanent upgrade as well. So it's not just something you click, get a piece of gear and then that gear becomes obsolete and that whole thing was wasted. Not at all, you actually get a permanent stat increase. So each time you find one, it'll increase your loot luck stat, which then gives you a better chance to find high-end loot out in the game. So you wanna make sure to find all of these dice. Now, enemies aren't the only thing you're gonna be finding throughout levels. You'll also come across some rune switches and obelisks. So obelisks are a challenge arena that will allow you to kill enemies and then fight a boss for loot. It's like this gladiator style system that we've seen in the past. And these things are hard to miss. You'll either be directed towards them through side quests or you'll notice just a huge spire sticking out of the ground and natural curiosity will direct you to it. Now, the other interactive object are rune switches. These are sort of like a time trial. So you need to find and interact with all of them before the timer is up to have a chance at some legendary loot. Now, outside of the mimics, the goblins, and the challenges throughout the world, you're also going to be dealing with a variety of enemies. These range from like cannon fodder minions to mini bosses and tankier enemies. Now, we don't have a whole lot to sift through right now just because a lot of the gameplay we've seen has come from either one level or one area. But I mean, if we can pull anything from the past games, we can assume that there are going to be a good variety of things to shoot at. So with all of that out of the way, let's get into one of the biggest draws for Wonderlands, and that is the class and multi-class system. So with the multi-class system, you can mix two classes together to make the ultimate badass that fits your play style. We'll be getting to that after we talk about each and every class. 
Now, because this is a tabletop RPG, you will have a few decisions to make when you create your character. You need to choose a class, which is typical, but then you need to choose an archetype, which will give you a bonus. And then you also have to choose a background. So let's go ahead and break down these classes. So first up, we have the Stabomancer, this sneaky kind of crit focused class that's basically a rogue, but also comes with a heap of magic on top. So this class can summon these whirling blades that basically blend up enemies. And this class isn't just a one trick pony. It's actually a mini trick pony because you're going to be mixing up guns, magic and melee attacks. So Stabomancers are perfect for those people who are super indecisive and they spend hours trying to figure out what class to play. I mean, we all know these people, right? We're ready to play for hours and they're still mulling over decisions. They're still stuck in the character creator. I mean, talk about commitment issues. I know because I'm one of those people. So anyway, if that sounds like you, then pick the Stabomancer. They're just good enough at a lot of things to be deadly, fun, and pretty much fulfilling. So if you're someone who would love to kind of slip into the shadows and reappear screaming spells and waving daggers, then this is definitely the class for you. So let's keep this thing moving along and let's talk about the spell shot. So of all the classes, this one is the most normal sounding. You're a wizard with a gun, a gunslinger with magic. I mean, however you want to describe these things, they shoot bullets, they sling magic, and they take care of business. So this class does take some of those classic mage abilities like transforming things into sheep and unleashing torrents of elemental magic to bury your enemies with a snap of your fingers. Now, while the Stabomancer is kind of a bag of tricks, the spell shot is more focused on a concentrated play style and that's ranged combat. You're an absolute cannon. You will melt things in front of you, but you are squishy up close. So you need to be quick on the draw for your spells and bullets. But if you do happen to get into a sticky situation, you can always polymorph your enemies and then get away. So ultimately, if you like mixing magic and guns and kind of weaving those things together, the spell shot is a fantastic class for you to try out. Now, the next one we're talking about is probably going to be my main. I can just feel it. I can feel it in my bones, and that's the Clawbringer. So have you ever wanted to be a paladin that wields this kind of spectral hammer, but also has a pet wyvern? Well, Wonderlands definitely has delivered because you're going to be a wyvern riding, hammer waving paladin who is hell bent on purifying everything through fire and lightning. Welcome to the Clawbringer. So the Clawbringer focuses on fire and lightning damage, but they aren't selfish. They are team players. They have something called a dragon aura that will empower the whole party with additional fire damage and other benefits. They're like a pharmacy for buffs. So you're this powerhouse dragon rider that also supports everyone else because your heart is bigger than your hammer. And to build on the whole hammered in play style that's been around since Diablo 2, this class can also throw their hammer to zap and roast everything with lightning or slam it into the ground to unleash a fire nova, basically barbecuing anything that gets caught near you. And while you're pounding everything into oblivion, that little wyvern of yours is torching everything with fire. It's like the ultimate wombo combo. So that is why I love the look of this class. I'm almost always a paladin. I like support. I like pet classes. So this one was literally designed for me. And if for some reason I can't be a Clawbringer, then I want to be the Frosty Barbarian, the Berserker. This bruiser is all about getting up close and personal with their engagements. But here's the thing. They don't only swing a huge axe and speak loudly. They also have the ability to freeze enemies and shatter them into thousands of pieces. So this is a bit different than what we've seen in other games. Most of the time, Berserkers and Barbarians are all about bleeds and extremely physical attacks. But this Berserker is almost like a frost giant that just so happens to enjoy melee carnage. And as for a berserker, you'll be specializing in melee and frost damage, but also taking advantage of something called enrage, which is a buff that's granted by your skills. Now, once you're enraged, you can channel the power of frost through your weapon, so you'll be able to freeze enemies. But also, here's the deal. They're very hardy characters, so you can take a pounding, but no one is immune to damage, right? So this class has a way to help offset all of that damage you'll be taking, because they'll be able to leech health from dead enemies to help you stay topped off. So it's a really cool combination of skills. I mean, you whirlwind to enrage, which gives you a frosty boost to deal even more damage. And then once that thing you've been chopping on finally dies, you get to steal their life force to heal yourself, which is absolutely metal. And I love this class. So let's move into the last two. First, we're going to talk about the Graveborn. So have you ever wanted to be an edgelord who sucks the life out of enemies and then sacrifices their own health to inflict pain? 
If that sounds like you, the Graveborn is probably a good fit for your playstyle. This class excels at death magic and summoning minions from hell. And the real signature of the Graveborn is his Demi Lich companion that offers some air support. That way you can kill things more efficiently. So whenever you cast a spell, the Lich will also cast a spell. So you'll be able to weave together these casts. That way you can create some really cool combos to take care of most enemies. Now our last class we're going to be talking about is the Spore Warden. So this is a foresty boy with a pet mushroom that can spew poison all over the place. This class excels at basically being your typical ranger. You kind of stick back behind the front lines, you alternate between launching just volleys of arcane arrows or dropping frosty tornadoes on enemies. There's all sorts of really cool stuff that the Spore Warden can do. And if you really want to be a hardcore pet focused class, the Spore Warden is definitely right up your alley. And you can combine them with the Graveborn to make the ultimate summon class. So now that we've covered all of the different classes we can play as, let's talk about their skill trees before we get into how multi-classing works. As you level up, you're going to earn skill points, and then you can invest those points into nodes on each tier of your skill tree. Now, these range from increasing damage to completely augmenting the way an action skill will work. And once you've invested five points into a tier, you'll be able to unlock the next one. Now, this cycle continues until you reach your final node, and you can always still go back and fill in more nodes if you want to, but just know you won't have enough points to fill in both trees for multi-classing. So you want to make sure to think and choose carefully what you really want to invest in. Don't just throw those points out there willy-nilly. Have sort of a kind of framework of what you want in your mind and then invest in those particular nodes. So beyond skill trees, each class also has hero stats that are going to grant you passive bonuses, and you're going to be given 10 when you first create your character. After that, you can earn more each time you level up. Now this continues all the way up until you reach max level of 40. Now after that, you will need to do challenges in order to earn more points and then continue boosting and improving your character. So you're probably asking, what are these challenges? So challenges are scattered throughout the game. They range from finding sets of hidden items to defeating every boss at the obelisk. So you're probably wondering, what are the stats that you actually get to use once you unlock more hero points? Well, they're the classic RPG stats, right? You have strength, you have dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, constitution, and attunement. Basically, you're playing an RPG, so here they are. So strength will increase critical hit damage. Dexterity will increase your critical hit chance. Intelligence will decrease your spell cooldown. Wisdom will increase your status damage. Constitution increases your maximum health and shields. And attunement reduces your skill cooldown time. So these are going to be absolutely fantastic to go through and specialize in to really kind of round out whatever build you're going for. If you want to go stab a mancer, get that increased crit chance and then drop even more points into dexterity to maybe get to a point where you're always critting with that 100% crit chance, drop a few points into strength to increase your critical hit damage. Now you're just absolutely rolling through stuff. I don't know entirely how that's going to work or if there's going to be soft caps and all of that because we don't have access to the numbers right now, but this being in the game is something that I'm very excited for. And one thing I know lots of players are going to be asking about is can you respec? Can you reset these stats? And that is a big yes. So after reaching a story milestone, which the devs confirmed is very early in the game, you can respec these points at any time. That way you can try out new builds, new play styles. And this is something that I really, really love because I just, I can't stand when you're locked into a certain play style and get punished for experimenting. So big kudos to the devs for going this route rather than going the Path of Exile or Diablo route. Okay, so with all of that out of the way, let's talk about one of the biggest features of Wonderlands, and that is the multi-class system. So with this system, you're going to be able to smash two classes together to form this ultimate play style that you're after. So how does it all work? So once you've hit a certain point in the game, you're going to have the ability to select another class to add on to your existing one. And once you do this, you'll get access to that secondary class's skills, their class feet, and their skill trees. So class feet is going to be the class identity. So for instance, the mushroom companion, the demi lich companion, those are both class feats for the spore warden and for the graveborn. So once you multi-class, you're going to have four skills to choose from, plus the class feats will stack meaning you can have the increased crit chance from the Stabomancer or another pet from the Spore Warden or the Graveborn. 
and you can spend any of the skill points in either of the skill trees, giving you much more flexibility to make some really awesome builds. Now, one of the big questions you probably have is whether or not you can change your secondary class. Is it a permanent decision or is it something you can be flexible on? And that answer is yes. You certainly can change your secondary class once you've reached a certain story point. So you can be something like a Stabozerker or a Grave Warden or a Spellmancer or a Burborn. There are so many possibilities with this game and being able to kind of smash these together and check out different play styles. There's probably going to be some that are downright terrible and there's going to be some that are incredibly overpowered. And I just cannot wait to dive in and check all of these out. Now that we've talked about everything that happens kind of outside of the combat, let's talk about that one thing you're gonna be doing the whole game and that's fighting stuff, blowing things up, collecting tons of loot. So that way you can do even more fighting and more blowing up. Combat in Wonderlands is going to be a very chaotic experience. You're going to have skills, guns, and melee, a bunch of different tools to participate in all of the carnage. So each class comes with two action skills that they can use to really kind of unload on a porcel, right? You have frozen domes, you have meteors from the spell shot, you have summons and arcane arrows from the warden and so on and so forth. Now the developers made sure to mention that these skills and spells are something you won't have to wait on for too long. You should be able to cast them pretty frequently to help out in combat, which I absolutely love because there's nothing worse than using just like this really awesome skill and then looking down and seeing it has a 45 second cooldown basically leaving you just just use standard attacks for a minute. It just, it isn't fun, it isn't engaging. This is something I really like where you can almost chain fire these things off. And these spells and skills can be augmented through the skill trees we talked about earlier, but you can also pick up items that'll give you spells to cast. Now these are replacing the grenade system from previous Borderlands games. So you can swap these around to get the spell you want or have something that syncs up with your build, like having a fireball spell or a frostbolt, for instance. So let's move into the weapons. Now all of the weapons in the game have a kind of Dungeons and Dragons high fantasy take on guns. You have a fully automatic crossbow that shoots frosty projectiles. You have a lava spewing cannon. You have a gun that, that slings waves of frozen energy to stop their enemy in their tracks. But the real thing here is how these weapons all perform together and create a whole play style themselves. For instance, you can carry tons of frost weapons that'll help you encase targets in ice, which then sets up a nice combo for spell shots like a meteor spell, or maybe even a clawbringer's lightning spell to help clean things up. So overall, it's a really smooth and engaging system from what we've seen so far. Now we even have some new weapon types joining the party, which is really cool. We have melee weapons. Now we did have access to these a little bit before with Krieg, but these close combat weapons are going to be a huge piece of the combat puzzle for Wonderlands. But with that being said, they're not powerful enough to completely overshadow guns. So unless you have a specific item or something that is going to enable or give you a ton of melee damage, then you're probably not gonna see a ton of melee centric or melee only builds. That's just not the kind of play style that they're going for. They still want guns to have a place. So what makes up a gun, like a weapon? Well, it kind of depends on the foundry that made it. And even beyond that, there are certain things to look for on weapons too, like enchantments, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But the first thing I wanna talk about are foundries because foundries will determine how a weapon performs. So in terms of your ranged weapons, we have the Dahlia, which specializes in swapping firing modes. You have full auto or burst fire. It's kind of like a choose your own adventure, figure out how you want to go and shoot things. We have Black Powder. These guns have a very unique perk that makes their bullets ricochet on headshots because, again, sharing is caring. Next up is the Fuhrer. This is a whimsical brand whose weapons will take on new forms when you fling them across the battlefield. So, for instance, if your SMG runs out of ammo and you need to reload it, you hit reload and you'll throw your SMG and it'll grow wings and start attacking enemies from the sky like a Pegasus. So, there's some really cool stuff with Fjord. Next, we have the Stoker. Now, their claim to fame is the fastest fire rate imaginable, so you'll probably burn through ammo like crazy, but the enemy's health bar should drop just as fast. Now, the last three are Torque, Skulldugger, and Hyperius. For Torque, I mean, you guessed it, it's been a classic, a trend. It is explosions, just explosions and more explosions. So if you like explosive weapons, the Torque is for you. Then we have the Skulldugger. Now, the Skulldugger is all about kind of like arcane trickery. So these are going to generate their own ammunition, so you don't have to worry about carrying like crates of bullets with you. However, they will overheat and you need to give them a break from time to time. 
Now, Hyperius is our very last manufacturer. These provide a nice magical barrier to help protect the shooter, and they become more accurate as you fire. So hold that trigger and get to streaming. So those are the ranged weapon foundries. Let's talk about the melee weapons. So first we have Valora. Now Valora is gonna make weapons exclusively for Berserkers. I mean, they specialize in large two-handers that deal tons of damage. They're a little bit slower than the rest, but they make up for it with just those high numbers. Then we have Swift. So if you're looking for a good blade that attacks fast but deals low damage, and you're basically looking to inflict death by a thousand cuts, then Swift is for you. Next up is Cleave. So are you more of a Viking plunderer who likes a well-sharpened ax? then Cleave has your number. These weapons have high crit, medium attack speed, but they do offer lower damage than Valora, for instance. Lastly, we have Bonk. These are just how you imagine them. They are high damage, low crit, and medium attack speed, basically caveman approved. So beyond the weapons, we also have specific foundries for accessories. So things like Vatu is making rings and amulets, Conjura is making the grenades, aka the spells, and then Ashen, Pan Goblin, and Hyperius are your foundries for shields. And because this is Wonderlands, all of these items will come with a rainbow of rarities, each one giving more or less benefits to take advantage of. We have the usual suspects, common, uncommon, rare, epic, and legendary. Now, legendary items will have highly sought after effects. These will allow you to crank up your damage and survivability, which means even more carnage. And some will even have special effects that'll make playstyles possible. For instance, I saw a teaser image of one that takes your health all the way down to one, but gives you 150% increased shield. So that's the classic low HP build. Very curious to see what people do with that, but that's something you can also look at. So let's go ahead and take a step back. I mentioned enchantments earlier. Now, what are enchantments? So these are special effects that can be found on weapons that do something. They provide an effect based upon an action. And if you played Borderlands 3, these are basically replacing anointments. So here are some enchantment examples. On your spell cast, you're gonna increase gun damage for 10 seconds. On an action skill cast, you're going to increase your spell damage for 10 seconds. While an action skill is active, like a summon, increase companion damage for 10 seconds. So all of these are going to kind of help round out your build. Now, they're probably not going to be build defining, but they're going to help increase or prop up whatever you're doing with your build or with your character. And if you don't like what came on a weapon, you can actually change it. Back at the town hub, you're gonna have the enchantment reroller, and you can spend moon orbs to reroll that enchantment to something that's a little bit more your style. And moon orbs are basically the new Iridium from previous Borderlands games. So now we talked about all of the weapons, let's talk about where we're going to be holding those, and that is the inventory. So the inventory screen looks very reminiscent that we've seen from previous Borderlands games, but there are some noticeable changes. So in terms of your inventory, you can hold four guns and one melee weapon at any point in time. Now these slots will unlock over time as well, so you're not going to be able to hold all four weapons right at the start. And if it's anything like previous games, you're going to need to reach certain story milestones to unlock these. Now to build on top of that, you can also equip two rings, which will provide flat stat boosts. You can equip an amulet, which will give you something unique, like for instance, instantly reloading your weapon whenever you hit something with a melee attack. You have a shield, which will give some stats and operate a little bit differently based on those manufacturers. And lastly, you have your spell book, which replaces grenades like we talked about earlier. These are used to cast spells. They range from fire and forget spells to fireballs where you need to kind of hold down your key to continuously cast them. So picking the right one makes a world of difference. Now we also have armor, which gives some skill point bonuses and provides stats like increased crit damage. And the more rare armor you get, the better and more stats it will have. So that is our inventory that's gonna be holding all of our cool tools of destruction. But there are a couple of last things I wanna talk about. Now, the second to last thing is gonna be end game. Because with any good RPG, the end game is where the game truly begins. So end game for Wonderlands will take the form of chaos chambers. Now, these are a completely randomized dungeon consisting of three rooms of enemies and objectives, then a mini boss fight, then three more dungeon rooms followed by the main boss. So we're gonna have a decent chunk of content to play through for each session. And these chaos chambers take around 20 minutes to complete. And you do only have three lives to complete the run. But we do have some variables in here. 
So each time you complete a room that doesn't directly lead to a boss, so rooms one and two and five and six, you're gonna have two portals that open. And these are gonna give you a small degree of choice of what you see in the next room. So they didn't go too deep into this, but just know we are gonna have a little bit of control over what we're gonna be walking into. Now at the end of each run, you're going to be rewarded with moon orbs, which are, like I mentioned, replacing Iridium in this game. And you can spend these at that enchantment reroller back in town. But during your run, you're also going to earn something called crystals. Now crystals will affect how many rewards that you earn at the end of a run. The more crystals, the more rewards you get. So you wanna make sure to grab as many as possible. But that's not all crystals are used for. Crystals can also be used to purchase blessings from altars during your run. Now these blessings are stackable and they can give you something like increasing your melee and attack speed, for example. So if you're somebody that uses a lot of melee weapons or you wanna kind of give yourself an edge, you can sacrifice some crystals to give yourself a blessing to hopefully power through the next room. Now, we also have the opposite of blessings and those are curses. These can be accepted in exchange for higher crystal yields or better rewards. So you have to ask yourself, do you want to take on the extra challenge and risk losing all of your lives for crystals, or do you want to take the safe and easy way to victory? So once you've finished up the Chaos Chamber run, you're going to find yourself in a new room with a chest in the center full of loot. You've earned it. You did a great job. Thumbs up. But that's not all. There are also rabbit statues lining the room that all have different loot icons. And if you feed those rabbit statues your crystals, they're gonna barf up items for you to loot. And this is gonna be the best way to chase after your best in slot items. So like if you're looking for a nifty sniper rifle, find the bunny that has the sniper rifle icon and just feed it all of your crystals. You're gonna see tons of them fly out, sift through them, see if anything in there is worth using. This is much better than previous games. Previous games, you had to kill a boss, reload the game, kill a boss, reload, all for a certain drop, and it just, it was frustrating. So this, I really, really, really like. Now, they also mentioned another piece of endgame called the Chaos Trial, but we don't know anything about that one quite yet. So even more to come when it comes to endgame. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before we wrap this thing up is the Season Pass and the Content Roadmap. So our first DLC is confirmed for April 21st, which is less than a month after launch. What we're gonna be getting is the Dreamvale Overlook, which is a new area with the Mirrors of Mystery. Now these mirrors will reveal new dungeons and bosses to fight, giving us another thing to progress through. Now they did mention that these can be purchased individually or you can get all four with the season pass. Now these mirror boss fights will dish out a boss that becomes more powerful each week, and keeps charging itself up until it reaches its final form. And then on top of that, each encounter will come with better loot. But loot isn't the only thing you're going to earn with each victory. You're also going to gather lost souls that you can then spend on the Wheel of Fate. And each spin will reward you with new legendary weapons and legendary gear, as well as unique cosmetics. So there's a lot of stuff to earn and unlock here. But here's where things get pretty cool. So as you complete these mirrors, all of that content becomes available in the Chaos Chamber, giving us even more content to continuously replay. So besides the Mirrors of Mystery, we're also going to be getting a new class. Now we don't know anything about this one quite yet at the time of this video, but just know we're gonna be getting something new that then we can multi-class with or choose as a main. So again, more stuff, sounds pretty good. We'll also get some new cosmetic items, and things to equip on our characters. So guys, this should be more than enough to get you started in Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. I know we're still missing some key info, but from what we've seen so far, I think it's gonna be a super fun time, lots of stuff to play through, and it's gonna have high replay value, which is always something that's encouraged in today's gaming industry. So everyone, thank you so much for watching. I know this was a longer video, but I wanted to get something out there that was just packed full of information. That way you only had to watch one video instead of 15 videos. That way you're prepared and ready to go for Wonderlands dropping here in the next few weeks. Thank you all again. This has been Vulcan and I will talk to you next time.